morning uh, and afternoon uh, in uh, central Canada. Welcome to a uh, what we hope will be a special discussion of an important book and an important subject. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're, it's a cross Canada uh, event today, co-sponsored by the University of British Columbia and the University of Toronto here at UBC. It's our School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. And at uh, the University of Toronto, it is the Monk School. Uh, so this is a, uh, as I say, a Canada-wide appreciation and look at an important book and an important subject. I'm Paul Evans. I'm a professor here at the <clears throat> Institute of Asian Research and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs on the West Coast. Later, Diana uh, Fu, my co-moderator, uh, will join us for a uh, leading part of the session as well. We have before us uh, a fascinating new book that uh, is, covers the Canada-China relationship for 50 years. The book <laughs> took almost as long to write as those 50 years. Bernie Frolic has been working on this subject for, for more than 30 years. Uh, it's a book that digested and developed uh, in, uh, uh, as, as events unfolded. And its publication is, is a significant scholarly accomplishment based on years of work uh, on archives, uh, principally through the Department of External Affairs, um, and interviews with many, many dozens of people. In addition to a, a work of, of considerable historical uh, effort, the, uh, the book is also a memoir of a sort. Uh, Bernie, as an observer, uh, of events of which he was a part, not just as a scholar, but as a player on some occasions, uh, and as a, um, a person with considerable journalistic capability. His first book, uh, Mao's People, was a wonderful synthetic creation uh, that brought social science together with um, what we would now call ethnography. This book, um, Canada, China, Over 50 Years, is, is, is both of those, but it's also a work of political science and of political precept. Bernie's book is not treating history of the relationship as inert and past, but as a foundation uh, and as a, a challenge uh, for what Canada and China do going forward in, a, in, a, in, in, in pretty changed circumstances and difficult circumstances. So uh, this is a chance. And uh, we'll look forward to um, uh, questions and comments that you can post on the question and answer button uh, on, your, on your screens, on the Zoom screen. And uh, we'll begin, however, with uh, Diana Fu uh, moderating uh, some commentators' uh, presentations, panelists who are going to uh, to give us their thoughts. Three interesting people from very different angles. But let me let me turn the, the microphone over to Diana Fu, who's Associate Prof in the Political Science uh, Department and the Monk School, and the Director of the East Asia uh, uh, Seminar Series uh, at, the, at the Monk School. Diana, it's over to Toronto. Thank you very much, Paul. And we are absolutely delighted to be hosting this event, co-hosting this event, along with uh, Professor Evans, who is a professor in the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia. Um, before I introduce our, uh, our distinguished set of panelists, I also had a few words to say about the book. So um, Professor Frolick's book is a very special book. It's special not only because it uh, it's it was 30 years in the making, three decades in the making, tracing the bilateral relation between Canada and China from Trudeau the senior to Trudeau the junior. And in this 50 year arc, which begins with diplomatic relations being established in 1970, nine years before the US formally normalized relations with China to 2021 under Justin Trudeau, where the, country, the two countries really found themselves in a new diplomatic low. This book really brings to life all that happened, all the important events, all the backstage conversations um, within this five 
decade cycle. And it's based on an impressive a range of interviews with five prime ministers, 35 ministers slash heads of departments, and over 40 members of global affairs, as law, uh, and along with archival research, which is an impressive amount of research to go into any book. But also, as Paul mentioned, um, this book is also special for a second reason, which is that it is deeply personal. Professor Frolic himself with, was a participant observer to the transformations in China in the past five decades. He arrived in Beijing all the way back in 1965 when he saw, to quote um, Professor Ber uh, Frolic, an immobile population with peasants living in straw huts without drinking water, a truck factory without an assembly line. And over the course of the decades in his capacity, first as a diplomat in the Beijing embassy and then as a professor of politics at York, he's really lived and breathed the changes in Canada-China relations. So it's really through this very personal trajectory, very personal lens that gives the book a very intimate tone. And it allows the readers to see China through the lens of a Canadian who has, who has and still maintains deep connections to the people um, beyond the formal realm of dip diplomatic relations. So before I continue, um, before we continue talking about the book, I also want to um, allow me to introduce the author himself, as well as our panelists, who will each share their reflections on this very special book. We have, a, of course, the author of the book, Professor uh, Frolic, who is also the executive director of the Asian Business and Management Program, and Professor Emeritus of Politics at York University. In addition to this book, he's also author of two other books. We have um, as our first distinguished panelist, the Honorable Jack Austin, who has been a central figure in Canada-China relations dating back to the period of Pierre Trudeau's push to recognize the PRC. He was a member of the Senate of Canada for 32 years, representing British Columbia and has championed stronger relations between Canada and Asia. And he was a key force in establishing the Canada-China Business Council. We have Julia Bentley, who is a career diplomat whose work has focused on all parts of Asia. She has served as a diplomat in China during two postings um, and Taiwan and India, where she was cross accredited to Nepal and Bhutan. And she was appointed as High Commissioner of Canada in Malaysia from 2017 to 2020. And we also have Pascal um, Massat. Professor Massat is an assistant professor in the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. And she is currently a member of the Canadian Minister of Foreign Affairs Indo-Pacific Advisory Committee. And she has also served as a senior advisor for China and Asia to various Canadian cabinet ministers at different points between 2015 and 2021. So having just given some brief introductions to these illustrious um, panelists, I will now hand it over to each of the panelists, starting with the Honorable Jack Austin, to, um, uh, to make his remarks. And I also remind um, everyone in the audience that this is being recorded. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, the Honorable Jack Austin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Diana. And I want to uh, uh, concur in your uh, comments and those of Paul Evans about uh, both about Bernie and about uh, the nature of the book. Uh, it's an amazing uh, review of Canada-China relations. And quite frankly, uh, very few Canadians know anything about this topic. They know a little more about China itself, but very little about the Canadian uh, relationship with China, the uh, reasons for its initiation, uh, its continuum, and uh, the difficulties that uh, exist in dealing with China, historic difficulties, as well as in incidents that create uh, difficulties. So uh, what I want to say is that uh, we have themes uh, that are significant in the relationship which Bernie has brought out. Uh, his discussion of human rights, his discussion of the uh, conflicts between uh, the human rights concerns of Canadians and the trade uh, importance uh, of our relationship with China. China in in the 50 years that Bernie has described it, has emerged from the poverty of 1965 to um, the world's second strongest economy, uh, clearly uh, a contender for the world's strongest economy. 
Uh, the trade people, the people who look at business and trade and the importance uh, of uh, China to the uh, well being of the Canadian economy, uh, tend to set aside uh, rights issues with respect to China. Uh, and uh, people who uh, are concerned with those rights issues tend to set aside the trade importance uh, of uh, China to Canada. And there, thereby lies the dilemma. Uh, I want to make uh, one uh, observation of my own, and that is that uh, uh, Canadian governments have tended to sidestep the issue that Bernie has so successfully described. Uh, and and uh, he's described how Canadians have behaved in dealing with this dichotomy over the last uh, 50 years. Uh, I wished that uh, Canadian governments had been uh, clear, very clear uh, in the way the American government had been. And I was going to uh, refer to a statement uh, that the American uh, security advisor, Sandy Berger made uh, saying that uh, uh, the national interest required the United States to uh, engage with China despite its human rights record. That would have resolved, I believe, uh, some of the uh, ambiguities that uh, Canadian officials, uh, ministers, prime ministers have, have dealt with. We, we in Canada tried to straddle the issue and uh, we have uh, got it uh, uh, as a perplexity. Uh, in any event, Bernie, I want to say Thank you so much for the uh, uh, way in which you have added your own personal notes. You're a student of communism. You started with uh, the study of Russian communism. And from your book, you happenstanced <laughs> into China, a very fortunate happenstance, uh, deciding to take a train in 65 and take a look and, uh, and immediately recognized uh, the profound role that China would play in the world. I have lots of other things to say, and unfortunately, uh, time limits those. But uh, those are my comments for now, Diana. Thank you so much. Wonderful. We now turn to Julia Bentley. Thank you, Diana and Paul, for the kind introduction and for having organized today's virtual launch of this magisterial work by Professor Bernie Froelich. I'd like to clarify that I'm speaking today in my private capacity as a fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the Department of Global Affairs. I'm delighted to have been invited to participate as I've known Bernie since the very beginning of my career, even before I became a diplomat, and it's an honor to be a member of this panel along with Senator Austin and Professor Pascal Masso. In his book, Bernie has thoughtfully curated selections from his archival research, interviews, and longstanding engagement as a Canada-China policy community member. He presents, presents persuasive arguments explaining the thinking behind Canadian decision-making at critical turning points in our relations with China and glimpses of the inner workings of our foreign ministry. What stands out for me are the points I'm going to highlight today tracing the narrative arc of Canada's intentions in its engagement with China, the gradual marginalization of global affairs and international policymaking and the China expertise within it, and sketching a strategy of selective engagement for the future. I also have a question for Bernie, if time permits, on the methodology and assessing perspectives of those interviewed. So tracing the arc of Canada's intentions in its engagement with China, Bernie chronicles the evolution of Canada's motivations in engaging with China over the past 50 years, starting with Canada's, quote, secular missionary zeal, unquote, in forging a special relationship with China. He documents the role that Canada saw for itself as a responsible global pay player. He uses the term Boy Scout in facilitating China's emergence on the international stage, starting in the 1970s and periodically for the next four decades. For 30 years, from the 1980s to the, uh, 2013, Canada's development cooperation program in China targeted human resource development, management training, and institutional capacity building, often pioneering aid to China in these sectors. The impact of this cooperation is often overlooked by both sides and deserves greater attention, including the role 
that Canada played in fostering Chinese civil society and building the capacity of Chinese non-government organizations. Uh, as Bernie notes in the book, June, June 4th, 1989 marked a turning point in bilateral relations and in Canadian public opinion, which shifted aiming to influence China's behavior on matters such as human rights, governance, and democratic development, including through sanctions. Bernie quotes a Canadian official uh, on the sanctions the, uh, which Canada imposed on China, saying that they had barely had an impact on China, if at all. Bernie underlines that this led to Canada developing a more realistic, more subdued, and less romantic view of China and of Canada's engagement with China. He astutely observes that many Canadians, uh, that Canadians were mistaken in assuming that Canada had sufficient leverage to change China in 1989 and its immediate aftermath. Yet 30 years later, when Canada was struggling with how to address the issue of Meng Wanzhou and the detention of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor, many Canadians still assumed that Canada should have sufficient leverage to resolve these issues. Bernie also notes the increasing ambivalence over time in Canada towards China at times verging on hostility. The book hints at the gradual marginalization of global affairs as a ministry and of Canada's expertise within it. In my personal view, a number of factors have contributed to the marginalization of global affairs and of the China experts within it, as well as to diminishing Canada's international influence and the, our effectiveness in pursuing foreign policy objectives. The book quotes foreign um, former Ambassador David Mulroney asserting that there was, quote, lackluster management performance of the Canadian bureaucracy, including global affairs, unquote, and inadequate China expertise at global affairs. Bernie notes that some disagree, pointing out that the Canadian government does have adequate China expertise, but that it is not well utilized by senior management. You won't be surprised to learn that, speaking personally, I support the second argument. Some reflections after 30 years in the Canadian Foreign Service about why it seems to be so hard for Canada to define a clear cut China policy. The growing role of the Prime Minister's office and central agencies on international issues has reduced the Foreign Ministry's room to maneuver in policy advice on bilateral relations and engagement with China on global issues. The high turnover of foreign ministers in the past 20 years has disrupted continuity in terms of political leadership on international affairs. Their short tenure does not lend itself to a solid grasp of nuance of engagement with China or to building effective relationships with counterparts and projecting consistent Canadian priorities abroad. And in most countries, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs is typically a career diplomat. Uh, this is not necessarily the case in Canada any longer, and this has an impact on perceptions of international counterparts. The Deputy Foreign Ministers of other countries with whom Canada needs to build alliances and build collective strategies for effective engagement with China. The shrinking scope of civil servants to advise on international policy matters and propose policy directions, and the sharper divide between political staff and civil servants, starting in the Harper years, are also relevant. The rise in domestic political considerations related to diaspora communities has complicated the formulation of Canadian foreign policy, amplified by the diversity within the Chinese Canadian community. And Bernie comments on this when he talks about um, the consultations taking place involving um, NGO activists and Chinese Canadian community and others who previously had not had a voice in shaping Canadian foreign policy. My question about methodology and assessing the perspectives of those interviewed will be il illustrated by two examples. So the question is, is there a risk in accepting at face value some of the claims made by those interviewed in the book? Um, and the first example would be, um, when David Mulroney was ambassador to China, uh, he recollected later that it was his initiative to draft the joint statement agreed in advance by Canada and China prior to the visit of Prime Minister Harper to China in December 2009. A month before, in November 2009, Prime Minister Harper visited India. And as head of the political section of the Canadian High Commission in Delhi, I led the negotiations with the Indian Ministry of External Affairs on the joint statement to be released after Prime Minister Harper's meeting with uh, Prime Minister Singh. So in my experience, such joint statements are standard tools of the trade, rather than an innovation starting with Prime Minister Harper's visit to Canada. Second example relates to a speech by Ambassador Bild at the Central Party School, which was set up by a Canadian diplomat when Zhu Rongji was the head of the party school. So according to the diplomat, as quoted in the book, 
he phoned this party school and said, quote, I am Canadian. I read in the People's Daily that you have a new president at the Central Party School. I'd like to talk to you about what that means and maybe talk to him, unquote. While it's quite possible that the, uh, in recounting this conversation, the diplomat spoke casually, uh, it seems to me highly unlikely that in the 1990s, a random cold call would achieve the results as described. At that time, reaching any Chinese official by telephone was an endurance test and identifying oneself as a diplomat most often prompted a stiff, if not officious response. The book, Canada-China, A 50-Year Journey, concludes with a strategy of selective engagement for the future. And as Bernie states at the outset of the book, we need to face the fact that Canada is now subordinate in its relationship to China. We have to be clear about who we are, a smaller second tier country tied to the Americans with declining leverage in international affairs. Are we prepared to step back, swallow hard and treat China as we do the Americans, deferring to a dominant partner and with the power to determine a large part of our relation? And he concludes, we don't have to treat China as a fragile state, nor should we ignore its communist authoritarianism or and its intelligence gathering activities in Canada. We can be firm and wary of China at one level, yet we can also combine that stance with more openness through expanded trade, education, and people-to-people -people ties. With the advent of the pandemic and the saga of Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels, bilateral relations have been in limbo for some time and will benefit from the vigorous pursuit of clearly defined Canadian policy of sober re-engagement with China based on Canadian national interests. This requires recognizing the political realities of polarized public opinion in Canada and the tendency to project domestic interests onto bilateral relations. In all of this, a realistic assessment of what China is today is paramount rather than aspirations of what we would like China to be, which will inevitably result in China's failure to conform to our expectations. Such a realistic assessment will benefit from a better informed public, more balanced media reporting, and a more sophisticated understanding of the realities in China today, as well as Canadian stakeholders who are willing to put Canada's national interests ahead of narrower domestic, political, economic, institutional, or advocacy interests. Thank you. And um, thank you very much, Julia. And uh, next we have uh, Professor Massat Pascal. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, merci. Uh, je suis bien contente d'être là. Uh, I'm also speaking in my private capacity um, as a professor. And um, I would uh, like to say to start, I was teaching today. I feel like um, uh, I do not uh, recommend a book. I assign it to you all if you're interested in um, Canada-China relations. So um, it's, a, it's an, just an instant classic and uh, so, so, so precious. Um, what I will do over the next uh, few minutes is offer a few thoughts about uh, the relevance today of earlier articulations of China policy by Canadian governments and, and more specifically the 1987 policy, uh, China policy, which was uh, effectively the first uh, fully fleshed uh, Canadian China strategy. Um, Chapter five uh, deals with, uh, with that um, uh, era. And I feel like it was such a, a, an interesting exercise to go back to those recommendations um, and to read the language in which they were steeped. Mm -hmm. some, some of the content actually remains eerily valid today. And then some of the content is also being overtaken by events. And I think that both sets offer their own kinds of lessons. So I, I'm just going to uh, pick two or three elements of that strategy and offer comments about um, how I think these resonate today. The first one um, was a principle taken directly from the China policy document um, itself which struck me uh, when I read it on page uh, 152, Canada has a stake in China's stability. Um, um, it's quoted uh, from the China policy at the time. I think that this is such a profound statement. Um, and I was still thinking about that when I reached the, the very last page of the book, page 400, and, and read the following statement which actually Julia just picked up on a minute ago. Today, we don't have to treat China as a fragile state. Uh, Professor Froelich uh, concludes his book 
um, with this, among other things. And those two, two statements um, uh, I thought were very, very interesting. So of course I understand, I think, what Professor Follick means at the end of the book, you know, China is different today than it was 50 years ago. Um, however, uh, it doesn't fail to escape me that some of the most difficult eras in Canada-China relations, arguably in, in uh, China's relationship with the West, uh, for instance, you know, the aftermath of Tiananmen or today co-occur with times of profound disruption and uncertainty and fragility uh, domestically in China. Um, what I think creates dissonance for the observer today is that there are these two very um, destabilizing dynamics that are at play at the same time in China today. Uh, you know, on the one hand, China continues to grow in importance, but at the same time, it's facing complex you know, domestic headwinds. You know, we could argue, or one could argue, that China's domestic vulnerabilities are not, strictly speaking, our problem. Um, but I would like to suggest that, uh, one, positions of vulnerability are, are real and significant in informing uh, Chinese government behavior, so we should understand them. But two, that they become the world's problem, actually, when they feed into a hardening or an inward looking, you know, anti-liberal authoritarian nationalist ideology in China. Um, so I think we, we could do with uh, pondering this, um, this sentence, you know, Canada has a stake in China's stability um, today as well. The second um, component of the 1987 China policy that I thought was interesting is that a number of the recommendations uh, have to do with how to do China policy as opposed to what it should be. I thought that was pretty interesting. So you have, you have uh, recommendations in there about promoting partnerships between governments and private sector, uh, establishing committees to encourage federal provincial you know, communication, convene periodic meetings um, uh, of leading academic and other China specialists, and then also uh, establish working committees that can link you know, uh, all, all these groups. So I, I thought that that was, that was interesting. Arguably, this is also relevant today. Um, the, the sixth recommendation actually goes uh, as the following, uh, convene periodic meetings of leading business, academic, other China specialists to ensure that a Canadian strategy is based on a national consensus. So there are two parts in that recommendation, the learning part and the consensus part. Um, on the learning part, um, uh, I think uh, Julia just mentioned this a minute ago as well. Uh, Professor Follick quotes folks who argue that today the core Ottawa government group um, is failing to consult with Canadians. Um, and it seems to me that I was trying to reflect on this, and it seems to me that the, the uh, efforts to engage with external stakeholders and experts um, seem to me to stem either from individual choices of uh, people inside of Global Affairs Canada or to be organized within the context of pan-Canadian large public consultation exercises. And I think that I would make the case that these are located at both ends of a spectrum and that we need to think maybe a little harder about how to create spaces for institutionalized interaction in the middle of the spectrum. You know, fresh methods for global affairs and other departments to remain connected with the expert community um, in a way that would be more consistent, but more fluid and integrated in the regular policymaking exercise. Um, the second part of that recommendation had to do with basing the strategy at the time on a national consensus. And I found that interesting too. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a noble aspiration, of course. It's perhaps not quite the right way to frame it in today's context. But the notion of consensus comes back at various points in, um, in chapter five. And there's even a quote there of Mulroney at the time who said in the House of Commons, I have indicated to the premier and the president of China that the intention of our government is to pursue the policy set out by my predecessor, with which I agree. Obviously, I don't think we would hear this uh, today, but I think it raises profound questions of public policy and democracy. And I would say two things are true at the same time here. Um, there are areas of larger consensus between Canadians right now. Not everything in the relationship is actually, you know, the locus of profound disagreements. Um, one of these, you know, areas would be, 
you know, I think this is fair to say that, that there is a consensus on the need for a defending domestic spaces from interference. Um, but where there is no consensus, and that is true in many areas of the relationship today, the Canada-China relationship, I think it is very important that we uh, cherish and preserve this diversity and remain open to a, a real variety of Canadian views on China. And here I weigh my, uh, my words carefully. There are many different Canadian ways to think about the relationship uh, with China. Um, why is this diversity of voices needed? Uh, because as Jessica Chambers uh, argues in a recent foreign affairs piece, a policy environment that incentivizes self-censorship and reflective positioning forecloses pluralistic debate and a vibrant marketplace for ideas. Um, we also need a diversity of views because there is a lot of uncertainty about the future of the relationship between China and the rest of the world. So in any case, to inform these debates now more than ever, a historical perspective is essential. And I thank uh, Professor Frolic so much for providing us uh, uh, plenty to draw from. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists for um, intriguing and challenging, um, challenging questions for Professor Frolic, who will now have a chance to respond to them. Okay, uh, let me begin first to thank our, <clears throat> the panelists for their excellent presentations. Uh, the problem is I probably agree with everything they said, and therefore it's going to be hard for me to uh, develop a critical analysis of their comments. But I had also prepared a short uh, uh, presentation uh, before we get to, to their comments about how and why I became a, why I got involved with China. Some of this is repetitive and I'm sorry for that, but I think that it's, it's my story. And uh, I guess I wanna tell you about it at least uh, for seven or eight minutes. So uh, back in 1965, as you've heard, yes, yes, I'm that old. Uh, I took a train from Siberia to Peking, which then called Peking and in the middle of the cold war, I had just spent a year in Moscow State University uh, doing doctoral research on Soviet, uh, uh, on, on Moscow so, and, and 10 other Soviet cities uh, on Soviet local government. Uh, the Soviet Union was struggling. It, constant shortages, endless bureaucracy, no individual space. China and the Soviet Union, formerly close comrades, had split uh, and war between them was imminent. Russian students at Moscow State University were embroiled in heated debates with visiting Chinese counterparts over the future of world socialism and so Sino-Soviet relations. I used to go and listen to these debates. Uh, now I had an unexpected opportunity to go to China myself and see communist, Chinese communism at work. At least a, a preliminary introduction. Would China be any better? For the record, uh, while I've spent a lifetime studying two communist systems, I'm not a Marxist. Uh, his ideas were compelling uh, to a young man, but after living a year in the Soviet Union, the Leninist run party state had ended any flirtation with Marx. The China that I saw, as we've heard from Jack and others, uh, uh, that I saw in 1965 was really poor. Per capita income was $200 a year percent of its giant 700 million population was below the official UN poverty line. I had been in some of Russia's poorest areas, but I was struck by China's much lower level of development. It had a tiny urban population of 12%, steam locomotives, bicycles, horse-drawn carts, no, uh, no, no cars, airports with dirt runways and recycled Russian airplanes. Uh, it, it, it was closed off from most of the developed world, armed with a revolutionary ideology. It was the year before the Cultural Revolution began. Uh, and it was especially wary of outsiders, and it still is. The contrast with today's China is remarkable. In only 50 years, China became the world's second superpower, and it soon will be its number one economy. As China's economic strength has grown, so has its uh, political and strategic 
influence. Now an aggressive international actor, barely responsive to criticism of its internal and external policies and ready to confront the current Western-based multilateral world to satisfy its economic, political, and strategic needs. So in my 50 years plus, 50 plus years with China, I've worked in Beijing as a Canadian diplomat during the Cultural Revolution, taught in Chinese universities, lectured in, in uh, actually delivered courses in those universities, lectured in a half dozen higher party schools, visited 25 of China's 31 provinces. And for over 20 years, I've been managing a York University trading program for Chinese entrepreneurs, officials, educators, and international students, both here and in China. Uh, although now, of course, it's all become, it's become a virtual program because of COVID. I also have visited China 60 times, uh, stopped only by the current COVID crisis. That experience, plus my personal access to Canadian government sources, interviews with over 100 officials, my personal China diaries, uh, which are its diary excerpts are in the book, plus a constant nagging curiosity about how we make China policy. All, all these things have made it possible for me to write this detailed record of how we constructed our bilateral relationship. And I build upon Paul Evans's earlier study of Canadian engagement with China. So thank you, Paul. Each of the 10 chapters tells the story about how China, Canada made a specific China policy decision. Uh, negotiations to establish diplomatic relations is one chapter, the enforcing the one China policy is another, why did we give China development assistance, how we put together our trade strategy that uh, Pascal just talked about, how did our government handle the Tiananmen crisis, uh, how, did we, how did we impose sanctions on China and were they effective, why have we struggled to, to find an effective human rights policy. Finally, why were Stephen Harper and Justin Trudeau in the end unable to maintain a positive relationship with Beijing. In the first 20 years, everyone wanted to go to China. It was exotic. China had opened up under Deng Xiaoping and we had what, what was called a China fever. We thought China was liberalizing. We thought we were helping China to enter our world. In the latter part of the 80s, Gorbachev had begun perestroika in the Soviet Union, and it was about to collapse. Was it possible that the Chinese party state too was also vulnerable and about to collapse? Then came Tiananmen in 1989, with, with PLA students, uh, soldiers using tanks to kill their own citizens. There would be no regime change in Beijing. The party state had prevailed, and we were confronted with the sobering realization that China would likely remain communist and authoritarian indefinitely. From the 90s to the Harper period, we looked to find a balance, what our ambassadors called a move from romanticism, or one of our ambassadors called a move from romanticism to realism, where we emphasized trade and people to people links and limited our human rights criticism. But relations again soured during the Harper period when the government actively criticized China's behavior. Seven years ago, Justin Trudeau sought to repair relations. But after aggressive behavior by the PRC the ban and the banning of several key Canadian exports and the taking of Canadian political hostages, our relations are now at their lowest point since recognition in 1970. Can we press a reset button? I have no magic solutions to offer, except not to disengage from links with the world's number two superpower. As one former Canadian ambassador has put it, you don't have to love China to have relations with it. My book talks of, quote, selective engagement, as one of you mentioned, uh, uh, focusing on the important bilateral ties that certainly we certainly have to continue, for example, trade, people to people links, and, and education. For example, we have $100 billion worth of two-way trade. There are approximately uh, nearly 200,000 PRC international students in Canada. Many of our 2 million Canadians of ethnic 
Chinese origin, have business and family ties with the PRC. I talk of maintaining a, a two-level strategy. On the one hand, we must keep engaging with China on that one level to ma maintain those important ties. On the other level, we must, we must be tougher with China, resist its bullying and its current assault on our sovereignty, control its espionage, and continue to criticize its human rights practices, even if we haven't been very effective in changing uh, China's human rights practices. Be prepared for Chinese retaliation when we impose restrictions on Chinese interference in our affairs. So today, most Canadians are wary, are wary of China. I think the public opinion polls uh, show that uh, uh, the majority, more than the majority of Canadians uh, have reservations about dealing with China. Trust has been lost. Its restoration begins with a tougher response to China's unacceptable practices. Ottawa is putting together a new China strategy that it says will help us to reset relations. We await its contents. Thank you. Um, and Professor Frolic, would you like to respond um, directly oh, to I'd like to as well? Take, take up some of the questions that my colleagues have have uh, have uh, 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 raised. But the problem is that I, I agree, as I said, I agree with almost everything that was said. So I'm going to have difficulty in in developing a critical uh, uh, critical uh, discussion. Okay. Um, I think Jack mentioned that most Canadians, uh, Jack Austin, most Canadians don't know much about Ch Canada's relations with China. That's definitely true. Uh, we 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 sometimes quickly pounce on some fact out there about what China is doing with imperfect knowledge as in trying to say what we should do about China. Uh, Canadians need to be much better informed about China. And on the other side, the Chinese are even uh, have much more difficulty in, in uh, understanding what's going on in Canada. I think, as I mentioned in the book, my students that I taught at the graduate students on Canadian studies, I taught in Beiwa, China, China's Foreign Studies University, uh, about 10, 10 years ago, uh, when asked about Canada, they didn't know much. They said, oh, yeah, you have the these are graduate students who are supposedly learning about Canada. Oh yeah, we yeah you have Niagara Falls and you've got Banff and uh, you've got blue skies and red maple leaves and you're you're tied up with the Americans. Uh, so and then I said okay and what and what about uh, uh, Can any Canadians that you know uh, that you can think of are important? Oh yeah, uh, Norman Bethune, of course, and uh, Pierre Trudeau because he established, helped establish relations, and Justin Bieber and Celine Dion. That was it. Uh, this was a class of twenty people. That's kind of depressing. So I think there's a, that's one area where there needs to be a much greater attempt to uh, uh, educate people on both sides uh, 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 of what the other country is all about. Uh, the conflict, uh, uh, identifying the conflict between human rights and trade, yes, that became, uh, in beginning in the 90s, even in the, late, in the late 80s, became, it seemed, a very significant uh, uh, part of our, what, what our policy uh, was that on the one hand, you want to try to encourage trade, develop it, but on the other hand, you're trying to criticize China for, for its human rights practices. And you wind up, there, there's a conflict between the two groups that are, are, are supporting this. And, and in the 90s, at the beginning at Tiananmen, uh, um, when Maloney was prime minister, we certainly, we, we tried very hard to focus on human rights. Uh, but then as, as, as that didn't really solve the problem, China doesn't respond to our criticisms, we began to uh, then look also in other uh, directions. And, and as Jack Austin knows, in 1994, we had the biggest trade delegation we ever sent anywhere uh, with all the provincial premiers except for Quebec and uh, Chrétien, the prime minister to China. And, and 
focused on trade and for Chrétien, the Mulroney's uh, view about uh, human rights had been uh, had been uh, discounted or uh, read, uh, significantly changed so that human rights no longer took precedence over over trade. Uh, uh, yes, it's still important, as he said, but as you remember what he said, I can't tell China what to do. I can't even tell the premier of uh, Saskatchewan what to do. How can I tell China what to do? That's a typical Chrétien kind of, uh, of uh, way of, of dealing with things. So I think that uh, we've been stuck in that, but since I think in the more recent period, I think we've we've sort of the the human we were constantly concerned about human rights in China, and I have a whole chapter about that. We're constantly concerned, but we uh, we have not had an effective strategy, and we can't change China very easily, if at all. Uh, many we have tried a half a dozen ways to or more, even a dozen ways to try to to uh, change China's practices and human rights. So uh, even as we also need to keep trading with China, because that's one of the main reasons why we have a diplomatic relationship with them in the first place. Uh, I think that uh, I, I, the, the mention of United States policy with China raises a whole other other area that I didn't really deal with in my presentation, which is we Canadians have, well, we began in the late 60s to, to, be, to liberate ourselves from, from American, uh, American interference or American influence on Canadian foreign policy. That was one of uh, Trudeau's, Trudeau's main, main ideas. Uh, so we thought when we recognized China, this was it. We were independent, independent in a way. The Chinese at the time, as we found out later on, uh, analyzed, what, uh, uh, analyzed us, us as being only somewhat independent from China. That's a direct quote. Uh, and But we've always basked in the glory of recognition and that we were off on our own. That, uh, the years went by, we realized more and more that we were really uh, standing uh, that the Americans are always behind us somewhere and we're always looking out for what the Americans were doing because that's what we were going to do uh, ultimately. Uh, and I think we had a pretty good partnership more or less until the Trump period, really, when uh, Trump and his allies <clears throat> uh, developed a, a, a economic policies with China that uh, significantly uh, affected Canadian China, China, uh, Canadian relations with China, and uh, we we could go into the deep discussion of that. But you know that that's what happened, and, and uh, uh, we then, as I say in the last chapter, to use the the Pierre Trudeau metaphor, uh, you know we were stuck between two elephants, uh, and uh, on both sides, the two superpowers, and we were caught in the middle, and. We are still somewhat caught in the middle, although we know which elephant we are going to follow in the end, which isn't China. If there's a, you know, that's just going to be. So and that's as far as what I, I, I took from Jack and many other things. Julius, Julius points were most important. Uh, uh, I think that, uh, uh, yes, it's hard to, to uh, be accurate to say, yes, this is what diplomat X or Y or official Z said, uh, and he and he uh, he's not embellishing, or she's not embellishing what happened, or is not saying this in order to please the interviewer. Uh, but in, in the case, it's very interesting. In the case of the, uh, I think it was uh, 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 Ji in a higher party school. That was interesting because it wasn't just the one the diplomat who told me this. It was actually the uh, the ambassador then read this and said, yes, this is what happened. Him. So I was, I didn't feel that bad about, uh, uh, I also wondered, I said, yeah, we, that was interesting. It just happened that you could read something in, in uh, Renan Rabao and then suddenly you could contact the, the higher party school. But in this case, uh, I could verify it. I tried to verify most of the things that I read uh, that the people told me by using the files, which I had a lot of, uh, much access to, uh, but it isn't possible. People, over time, people embellish things. They forget. Uh, they, uh, you know, they they don't want to reveal much to to outsiders. Uh, uh, anybody who isn't in the government in the department is an outsider, and you have to be careful with what you say because uh, all organizations like that have their secrets. 
secrets, and uh, uh, it's important for them to maintain them. I was lucky because early on I had been in the department, so somehow I was trusted a little more than some other people. But it was a challenge to know, uh, to decide. There are many things that I didn't put in that people told me because I couldn't rely upon. But and I and also the people that I did cite, many of them refused to be quoted. They had to remain anonymous, which was also a problem. But when somebody remains anonymous, somehow you feel that they're actually doing something more accurate than when they uh, put their name to something. But that's another story. Uh, as far as the current government pr problems with GAC with global affairs, uh, yeah, I think the. Uh, the things that uh, David Maloney writes about in his book about uh, uh, the lackluster man management and the, uh, too many silos in Ottawa, uh, a lack of, uh, yes, we have China expertise, but we can't, we can't get it put together. Somehow, I feel that that somehow is a legacy of the Harper period. And I'm not sure yet how to how to develop that in my own mind. That uh, uh, the idea that uh, there wasn't that surge of excitement and that that idea of creativity that existed in the '90s, uh, and also the idea and consultation, the the consultation with the, the so-called China policy community community. Yes, a few a few of us are able to consult with Ottawa from time to time, but in the 90s, we had meetings, many meetings that were put together of a half a dozen or, or even more, 15, 20 uh, uh, outsiders, so-called, from the China policy with foreign affairs, talking about a range of things. That has hardly happened anymore. And I think that the, the government needs those kind of moorings with the broader public uh, to be able to get a sense of of, of to, to be able to mobilize itself and and see what what is effective and what isn't and what real not just the pressure from the media or the politicians but more pressure and more ideas from the, the policy community itself so, uh, Professor Farley, just and, to um to interrupt you we are at time for this segment and I know that you're probably wanting to also answer um Professor Massat's question particularly about, about this, yeah. I'll say two words about pa Pascal, or maybe three. Uh, what pa Pascal's reading of the 1987 document uh, on econ our economic, uh, on our trade policy, our strategy for China. Uh, yes, it's, uh, much of it is relevant today. I think even more is relevant today than Pascal thought. I, I really feel that you could read it today and use it as a man, as a way, as a blueprint for engaging with China. Uh, it also, the final point is that it was done by a conservative administration, uh, Brian Mulroney, uh, and, the, and, the, and Mulroney was much more, even though people said, oh, he'd like to, he wanted to focus on human rights, he focused on trade and he was not, did not hesitate to, to uh, use the resources of government to promote trade and to work with the private sector, unlike Later on, the Conservative Party, his successors uh, would, uh, in the party, would say well, that's not really a good idea. Uh, that you have to you know, that the, the, the we don't want to over over uh, depend on the private sector. We need to let it develop itself. I think uh, uh, that this was a very good comment. I'm sorry I didn't. I'm sorry I ran out of time, Pascal. We can talk about this some other time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we have, I'm going to hand over the baton to Professor Evans, who will be steering the rest of the discussion. And I'm sure uh, that Professor Frolic, you have a chance to speak up again. So don't worry about that. Over to you, Paul. Um, great. Uh, well, we've uh, uh, had a lot of words uh, and um, uh, highlighted some of the aspects of the book and the, the Frolic perspective. Uh, we would encourage uh, your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, button uh, beneath, so, so please send them in. But several have already been accumulating. And Bernie, we're not going to let you off the hook on this question of the meaning of engagement. Uh, and a question that is in the mind of many is whether the book that you've written is a history of an idea whose time has passed, that circumstances have changed so substantially that we need to be looking at something that is, is not 
about rekindling a relationship, but moving into a new set of relations altogether. So those words, engagement and the word relationship are one that um, uh, people are asking about. And let me, let me focus the question to you in this way. Um, uh, on relationships, John Thornton has recently written that uh, an American who was talking about the American engagement strategy uh, and what is now in place in the United States. He said, if you want to have engagement, uh, you, it has to be built on a foundation of trust and mutual respect. You mentioned that trust is lacking at this stage, to say the least, not just in the Canadian public, but among many of our officials. Um, so is it, is it feasible that um, uh, a relationship that is something more than transactions, is it possible that we can have a next generation engagement arrangement with China that does have mutual trust uh, and mutual, uh, as trust and mutual respect in a government that seems to be going in China in very dark directions. What's the future of trust and mutual respect? This is, you want me to answer this too? <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, at first it might be a good idea to think that uh, uh, that's a question to pose me, to me and other academics here. But suppose we pose that to uh, uh, somebody in the business community, the Canadian business community that is selling their products to China or importing goods from China. Would they even think about this? Would they even worry about trust or uh, uh, unless, unless the Chinese were busy stealing their intellectual uh, uh, property uh, or uh, making or creating problems for them when they do business in China. So we have to decide when we raise these questions, you know, just, just what's the audience? Uh, the business community may not be particularly interested in that as long as they can sell their product. Ernie, we may have lost you. Um, while we're trying to get Professor uh, Frolic back online, perhaps I could turn that same question to Jack Austin uh, about trust and mutual respect. Is that imaginable in the era of Xi Jinping? You know, Paul, uh, thanks for the question. And uh, on the other hand, no thanks for the question. <laughs> it's a very difficult uh, topic. Um, you know, Bernie says, uh, Canada's challenge is to find a suitable pathway to maintain a partnership with China based on equity and mutual respect. You know, what th this is, these concepts, uh, trust, uh, it, these are uh, full of mutuality uh, in their uh, components. Uh, trust is a two-way street. Equity is a two-way street. Mutual respect is a two-way street. How do you rebuild those uh, uh, aspects of and uh, critical aspects of relationship with two very different normative systems, a Leninist system on the one hand and a rule of law system on another, because the two systems are built on different concepts of trust, uh, equity, and uh, mutual respect. And therefore, uh, what I found that in, in the practical world of addressing these issues is uh, essentially to the, the uh, Kevin Rudd trilogy of, uh, first of all, uh, work together on uh, subjects of mutual interest, such as climate change, uh, work together uh, to build trust where you disagree on fundamental issues. And third, where you can't cooperate, where you, can, where you can't cooperate stand away from any effort to make the situation more difficult than you, you found it and let time 
work its work its way. So that is, that is the uh, uh, behavioral uh, pattern that I think we're seeing now uh, in uh, growing in credibility in the U.S. I wouldn't say it is the behavioral pattern, but Blinken has said much of the same. Of course, the American system, whatever the uh, the spokespersons say, is subject to politics and political behavior and political interests that run the gamut of uh, uh, passion uh, and to uh, pragmat pragmatism. Uh, and the same is true of the, of the other issues. Uh, so this is, we're in an era uh, where each side is disappointed with the other, deeply disappointed with the other. And each side, I hope, is feeling its way towards a, a, a new beginning uh, in a world where each side has some, some commonality. For example, globalism in economic terms serves the economies of both of those countries greatly and punishes those economies as globalism breaks down, supply chains break down, markets break down, protectionism builds up. Uh, so there are ways that diplomats can work uh, on new beginnings. There are many ways they can do that. Uh, do I see that we have, uh, uh, our author has come back from uh, hey, his, his respite? You, you guys just disappeared, so I finally got back on. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, we, 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 we have you back, Bernie. Good. We were just dealing on the issue of uh, trust and mutual respect. Um, there's something else about your book that several people have been asking about. And it is the claim that has been made by, by some critics of the engagement strategy of the past that um, it is based on a, um, a naivety uh, about um, among Canadian officials, academics like yourself, who were interacting with China, but the claim is we're naive, did not see the real nature of Chinese communism, the Leninist party that you described. Uh, this is, is a, a comment that is, is not disappearing. Uh, and wonder how you react to it, Bernie. You've had a career as a Soviet specialist. You didn't come to this out of uh, a, a study of socialism. You came out of a person who had studied the communist system in, uh, uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, without impugning your own judgment matters on this, is it fair to say that Canada was naive in its interactions and believing that there were at least moments when special cooperation with China, where we could do things that others couldn't, was that naive belief in ourself also a false one? Well, you know, I think the criticism was leveled not on Canadian people, but really on our government, uh, that it was naive in the way it pursued policies towards China. The people, well, the people can be naive or not naive, but the government makes the policy. And I think that here, uh, there was one, I'll just go back to one specific incident when, when Tiananmen happened. And uh, our, we recalled our, our ambassador came back, Earl Drake, and he came back and he was interviewed by the press. And he said, we Canadians were naive about China because look what happened at Tiananmen. Well, that uh, blew up into a, a whole uh, criticism of the Canadian government that the Canadian government was naive about China, and that's why we were in this mess. Now, I can't say, you know, I my time within the government and afterwards, I can't say that I dealt with a lot of naive people, nor did, could I say that we had a policy that was designed only to appease or to uh, promote China, regardless of its warts. Uh, it may be, to be fair, that we, many people, not maybe in government also, but maybe private citizens, said, look, Russia is bad, look what they did, 
you know, look at all the horrible things the Russians did to get to where they were. And, and you know, but China is going to be different because China has got a different concept of the, of, of the world and et cetera, et cetera. And we're there to help them open up. And we can do that. And they maybe that room, uh, you know, unlike the Soviet Union, which was caught in the Cold War, and there was this constant, uh, and we had to get out of the, the abyss of Stalinism. Uh, with China, maybe cultural revolution is over. China was opening up in the 80s. This looked pretty good. Maybe that's where the idea of naivety came in. That's one area. The other area is when we began to promote trade with China and work and the, and the government worked very hard to get the traders connections with the top top people in China to sell our goods. Uh, and uh, uh, it may be the argument is uh, there was a, a bit there was naivety here that we would be able to accomplish this, that we that there was no cost to doing this, uh, that we would uh, profit by it. And maybe we didn't. Uh, you know, we do have $100 billion worth of two way trade, but uh, a lot of it is not value added. Most of it is China selling to us. And uh, maybe some people will say, you know, we were naive that we could uh, develop trade with China that, at that level, and we really couldn't in the end. But I don't know what else I can say about this. I, my argument would be, you, you could be naive, uh, uh, citizens, Canadians. I don't think Ottawa was naive, but I'm, I'm willing to hear other arguments. Um, I want to I want to raise a question that's been coming in, not just for you, Bernie, but also for um, uh, Julia Bentley and Pascal Masso. Um, and it's about the public attitudes, public attitudes towards China, which have been described as negative. Uh, and I think no one no one disputes that at this point. Um, but the, the, the question is, um, after 1989 and Tiananmen Square, there was an, a period of public negativity about China as well. But something then was built on a renewed engagement with China in the, uh, uh, as, as you described it in your book. In the year 2022, uh, there is public disenchantment as well. And it has been generated uh, in, in large part because of the three M's affair the arrest and uh, arbitrary detention of two Canadians, our, our two Michaels, but also because of a view that China is headed in a very dangerous direction, domestically uh, and uh, in repression and internationally becoming more assertive. Um, I, might, I might turn to both Julia and Pascal first to say if that, if, if that premise is right, uh, how can we build a relationship with a country when the public uh, isn't there and when events outside are moving in the wrong direction. Um, you two have both, uh, Julia, you've lived through many of these events. Uh, Pascal, you're trying to make sense of them now. How do we navigate it? Pascal, you can go first. Thank you. Um, well, uh, Listen, I have a few thoughts about that. I, I think that when we think about the present moment in Canada-China relations, what one element that I think is both relevant to the discussion we've had, um, just a minute here, um, that is both relevant to the discussion we've had up to now and to public opinion, I think is the transition from a relationship that was mainly a bilateral one until arguably, you know, five, 10 years ago. And that became um, a, a much more complex relationship uh, uh, seeped or couched into uh, global elements. In the 1980s, you know, there were ways that we could think about China, we could think about ignoring China, we could think about, um, you know, the bilateral relation, human rights in a bilateral fashion, we can think about trade in a bilateral fashion. Uh, in 2022, it's, it's not so much a bilateral 
uh, China is not so much a bilateral issue, it's a global issue, and that changes things. And I think it, it I think young Canadians get that. Um, I think that global issues that are important and that need resolving, uh, such as climate change, uh, a lot of Canadians understand that we need to figure out ways to, to interact constructively with China to figure ways out. And that's not the only one, you know, uh, I could name a few others. So I think that that's really important. Um, the, the framing, the evolution from the, the, the bilateral relationship to a more complex global relationship almost, you know, um, uh, is deeply meaningful. And I think we can start there to, to find um, areas for, <laughs> at the very least, functioning coexistence. And then uh, in, in the few areas that where we really do need to find uh, ways forward, well, there could be, uh, um, um, you know, efforts that resemble uh, cooperation. And so I would, I would just leave it at that for now, but I think it's, it's a very, very important um, evolution. Well, that's going to be a, a, a big challenge for any Canadian government is to navigate through these waters when, it, uh, when we have to bring the Canadian public along uh, on these matters when the, a consensus is broken down around engagement. I think we're already, we're already there. I think that the discourse on China has evolved um, from a, bi a strictly bilateral one to a more, a more global one. I think we don't speak anymore so much of the, you know, trade-off between trade and human rights like we used to do 15 years ago. Um, uh, so I think I think we're 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 there. Um, it can be, you know, the ground is laid for the development of a narrative that takes into consideration uh, global issues as a central component of our relationship with China. Great, Julia. Anything you'd like to add? Uh, yes, I'd like to pick up on a point that um, Senator Jack Austin made, which relates to um, the importance of identifying issues on which we need to collaborate. Many of those are global issues. The one he mentioned was climate change. There's also public health. There's food security. There's a whole range of them where um, there are common interests and there are ways where I think we can't afford not to be active in seeking how best to collaborate with China in a multilateral context on these issues. And I would um, raise the question of, um, can we find ways to engage with China on track two mechanisms in a way which we used to, but which seems to have fallen out of favor. And those would uh, cover, they could cover a whole host of issues. Um, of regional interest or uh, perhaps broader. And as examples, one could think of uh, regional security, maritime security. One could potentially look at issues like um, marine resources and global fisheries where China plays a very significant role. One could think about issues like the digital economy where if you construct a platform where the objective is among track two participants, to seek to identify common interests and what you can do about it rather than necessarily asserting the official stance of your own government, then there may be room for the emergence of building two things. One is actual concrete suggestions on how to address these issues and two, bilaterally, I mean, not bilaterally, collaterally, developing some trust. Um, there's, a, there's a stack of questions that have come in uh, in just the last last a few minutes, and let me let me turn to one that's quite pointed by a uh, a, a former Canadian diplomat, uh, and I'll quote from it: "If good relations are dependent on trust and respect, as as we discussed, and that it, then it is a two way street, is there any possibility of this becoming a reality? Uh, if China." Uh, has for centuries developed a visceral paranoia of all things foreign, combined with a sense of entitlement and cultural superiority. Uh, how do you, how, Bernie, do you react to that framing of the Chinese view 
of the uh, trust and respect question. Well, I think you can trust China if you do what they want. <laughs> I think that's what China sees. That's the way. That's the way trust works. And if it's mutual respect, you can. Uh, we can have mutual respect also today if we do what China wants. I think that, as I said somewhere in the book, China wants to reclaim its status as, as a great civilization and a great power, and it can and, and it will do this uh, with not necessarily following the normal procedures. Uh, of uh, the Western multilateral uh, rule of law order. So I, I don't, I think uh, uh, for Canada, it's important to regain some trust, again, some sense of, of that China, we can count on China to do certain things all the time in, in the appropriate way in a diplomatic, in a diplomatic relationship. Well, I'm not so sure the Chinese really are comfortable with that. They have their own sense of uh, uh, world order, and uh, we may have to adjust to that uh, continually. Down, down, and whether it's going to cost us uh, is a problem, and that's why I say we have to be tougher on China. We can't let them slide out of any kind of situation of trust, go back to some more more aggressive uh, relationship if we want to build proper links with China. Um, the, uh, it's funny of the five questions that have just come in, every one of them has the word trust <laughs> built into it. We're not able to, uh, we're not, we're, we're not able to dis escape this in, uh, in this discussion. Um, but I, I'd, I'd like to twist it, uh, in terms of trust of our principal, uh, partner, the United States. Uh, and uh, Bernie, your, your book is often about the American factor in the background of Canadian actions. Uh, we sometimes departed from specific American choices, but I, it would be difficult to think of any areas. And tell us if the historical record says that is incorrect. It's difficult to think of any specific areas in Canada-China relations, including recognition. Uh, in 1970 that ran against deep American strategic interests. And in an era where the United States is defining uh, its relationship with uh, China as one of strategic competition, um, does that really lessen uh, considerably the room we have for maneuver, recognizing we are, what was your phrase, borrowed from a former Chinese ambassador? What was your phrase? We are somewhat independent of the United States. Is the room for think, independence narrowing? How can we, we can't easily separate from American interests, except in, in, in international security, where America is programmed to defend the world, so to speak. Uh, we, we don't do that. We don't have the resources. We rely on America to do that for us. Uh, we we uh, recent events have just doubled the, the doubled the sense that we are fully committed to being part of the American the American operation the American uh, view of the world. Uh, I don't think we ever really sought or or pretended that we could. Uh, be um, a more, there was a time, I think, during Trump, when some of the public opinion polls said, oh, Canadians now trust China more than America. I think that was a crazy blip that disappeared fairly quickly, just as uh, Trump at that point finally disappeared, although who knows what's going to happen again. I think that uh, uh, we're caught between the two superpowers, there's no question about it. We don't have the American responsibility to, to, make, to be the peacemaker, peace, peacemaker of the world. Uh, we have our own particular narratives and our own limited objectives, uh, but we, we, are, we are couched in, 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 we are sleeping together with the Americans. We have no choice. And I think that uh, 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 I feel that more so now than 10 years ago. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play a trick here on our panelists and go back to Senator Austin, uh, who has spent uh, a huge amount of his career figuring out how to navigate a China policy 
uh, in line with, but uh, autonomous from that of the United States. Uh, Jack, what's your short answer to what that navigation looks like now? You know, we're in the uh, American sphere of influence in terms of uh, the importance and dependence of our economy on the American market. And our, our, our worst troubles are the ones the Americans give us from time to time uh, in this area. Uh, as far as, the, uh, uh, as China is concerned, it's an important market. Uh, and we are entitled through, through sovereignty and international practice to develop that market as best we can. Uh, and uh, to do that, uh, as, as so many have said, uh, we need to understand how the Chinese market works, what they need and how best we can supply it. Uh, that means constant study, constant effort. And I, I do want to uh, acknowledge the, uh, the Canadian government, its international trade people, uh, for the tremendous work they have done and do in uh, giving Canadian business market opportunity in China. So uh, I, I have to go back, Paul, you get, you've opened a door and I, I wanna go through it. I'm sorry to, I apologize to you, but uh, the, the messianic attitude uh, of the West, America, Canada is included, uh, we, we believe that we have a superior society. The Chinese believe they have a superior society. We have history, they have history. Uh, we put people into China preaching our messages. Uh, and in addition to that, in the United States, we have a, uh, uh, a doctrine of uh, um, maximum sec uh, control. Spectrum. Uh, Spectrum, thank you. Uh, and the Chinese look at all of this. And uh, the big issue is uh, uh, the US and its partners not wanting to be dislodged from a system they've created that has brought great prosperity to the world. And on the other hand, China's desire to uh, have a, uh, a role to play commensurate with its economic contribution to the global system. These, these are the issues that have to be worked on. Uh, the issue we have to work on is how we address ourselves in the world, the West, the US, Canada. Uh, is it, is it uh, how important is it in terms of global stability that we continue to push our message of our way of life, our superior values as we see them? Uh, against uh, the Chinese system? Uh, and how will they behave as we continue to press this message? Um, we've, we have <laughs> time for uh, uh, one more question, and I'm going to be impertinent and raise the question personally to Bernie, knowing that he is a great hockey fan. Uh, <laughs> Bernie has, uh, all of the years I have known him back to the 1980s, told me that the golden era for the Toronto Maple Leafs is just around the corner. With an addition here, an addition there, there's uh, great times ahead for the local hockey team. Now, Bernie, you are better at writing books than you are making predictions about hockey teams. Uh, but if we use the hockey metaphor on this, um, the three stars, looking back through all of the book you wrote, who do you think the future historians will look back as the people who were most significant and, and who we can learn from most in the history of the relationship, those 50 years, that you want to give your three-star selection to? That, that puts, that makes, that personalizes, that makes it really difficult. I think for the early period, uh, it was Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau, who who recognized China, the Chinese fell, basically uh, fell in love with them, the Zhou Enlai, Chairman Mao, all of them. And in, in his reputation continued for years as being the, uh, uh, a Canadian who had the, for the, in the foresight to bring China into the world community. 
So I think that uh, that would be one person. Uh, I mean, uh, who else is there that I can think of as a Canadian who the Chinese, who the Chinese think is somebody special? Is that is that the way? Well, I you, I remember remember what I told you about this. My students at, at Beijing Foreign Studies University they drop down to people like like uh, uh, Justin uh, like uh, Bieber and uh, Celine Dion. They don't really have a sense of who we are in, in, in a way and who our people are. So it's a hard question. I'm not sure I can answer it so easily. I, our prime ministers, some of them have done well, some of them have not. Some of them the Chinese think positively about. They like Jean Chrétien very much. He went to China a dozen times. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that uh, the, the, they see him as a, as a Canadian that uh, 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 made, made significant uh, uh, gestures to, to develop links with China. Beyond that, I can't say. That's one of the toughest questions I've heard from anybody, <laughs> Paul. Uh, good, because I'll make two nominations and the okay. two of our panelists at different generations, a Jack Austin uh, uh, in, a, in an era and a Pascal Basso, who's representative of, uh, of some fresh blood on the, on the, the line that we need in, uh, uh, in moving forward. Sorry, Julia, you fit in the middle. We'll put you on the defense uh, on this. Uh, on this all-star team. Um, can I just make one more suggestion, uh, which is relevant, I think, to the preceding comments, which has to do with, um, are we too reliant on the US? And I would extend that to like-minded countries. And I think we are stuck in a closed feedback loop and echo chamber when we're constantly consulting the like-minded. And I think what we need to do is consult much more deeply and uh, carefully with those who are in Asia, who cohabit the same continent with the resident superpower and look at how they are engaging with China and looking at how they are approaching the same dilemmas that we are in some cases, not always, uh, on how are they going to advance their own national interests when it is at loggerheads with what China seems to want or demand in their countries. And I think there's a lot to be learned from some very agile and nimble um, Asian countries, in particular, I'm thinking of Southeast Asian countries, uh, who have thought long and hard about this and who see it as primordial for their survival. So there's a lot for us to learn bilaterally and I think multilaterally or regionally in our engagement, dare I say it, with the Indo-Pacific. Well, from China policy to Indo-Pacific, uh, the theme of the moment and the day as we uh, cast eyes on Ottawa and, uh, and look at Bernie's book uh, as a way of telling us how we got to where we are now. Uh, Diana, uh, I think we've, we've wrapped up this section. It's, um, uh, it's back to you for the, uh, the closing benediction. Well, thank you so much um, to all the panelists, uh, to you, Paul, for host co-hosting, and of course, to our author and main speaker, um, Professor Froelich, and also to the audience members. I see there's still like 58 of you who hung on with us. So as a reward for you, we have a 25% discount on Bernie's book. Um, I don't actually know how to access that. Oh, there we go. And if you go in the chat, um, you will see a link to receive a 25% discount on Bernie's book, which I hope that by now um, you're all sort of dying to get your hands on. And so um, we really urge you to, to read it, to engage in these conversations. And I think um, as Pascal was saying earlier that, um, you know, we need something in between sort of like a national town hall or uh, and private discussions. And I really see these kinds of discussions that we are having to as such as the ones today and, and the ones that we host both at the Monk School and at the Policy School at UBC as those types of forums where people who are concerned about a range of issues with China uh, come here and, um, are, and, and talk. And so thank you for participating in this important um, civic dialogue. Um, and uh, with, without further ado, I wanna wish everyone um, a good evening, good afternoon, and please do join us for future events. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.